I ate actually two burgers for lunch. I'm a little full right now. And so if you see my eyes drooping, that's not because of you. It's just because I have a ton of burger in my stomach right now. Likewise, I we ate like a half an hour ago. And Perfect. So we're on the same page here. <laughs> we have to keep each other accountable, <laughs> keep each other afloat. Yeah, I was t I was talking to people about how after they implemented like the menus in fast food restaurants where you walk up and you actually choose uh -huh. yourself, the profits and revenue of fast food companies have gone up. And apparently the, the running theory is that when you're in front of like a person and you have a line behind you and waiting to order, mm -hmm. you'll go through things faster. Like right. you, you don't want to so like stress. Yeah. Or you don't want to like look like a, a monster who just like eats everything. <laughs> so like you, you try to like socially like. They will judge me for having that mo Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like it's, it's like I don't want to order too much. But whenever you give people time and there's no pressure there um, and then they don't, they don't feel like they're being judged, they will order more. Yeah. And apparently the most significant change that they saw when they did a when they ran a study on it is that I think I might not be exact on this demographic. It's definitely guys, but mm -hmm. I think it was specifically like single guys. There was a huge uptick in them getting two sandwiches instead of one. So most places, instead of just getting like a burger or a meal, they would get yeah. two. And I was like, I have done this before. I like, I'm definitely one of these people. Cause I'm, I've also like, I'm not like Mr. Soda. I don't really like soda a whole lot. I don't drink a lot of soda. Fries, that's fine. Like that's a common side for like a burger. A lot of times my mindset is like, I don't want that meal or the thing, the, whatever the value thing is that they have. I just want two of that main thing. That's how I feel. I want yeah, that sense. burger twice. <laughs> that's yeah. what I want. So yeah, when I heard that, I was like, that is exactly me. That's precisely yeah, what like I do. Psychologically, I can relate to that as well. I would be probably more, I, I, mean, I am more comfortable ordering that way. Uh, and also because by the, the way, uh, no, I mean, when or just two I get burgers. more comfortable just doing it on the thing, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and maybe like being, yeah, basically having more time to like decide. And also because very similar kind of background of this, I cannot eat gluten. And oh, so, you too. You're yeah. not the only one in our company. Okay, so you, you, you as well. And Lowry no, as well. No, not me, Lowry. Lowry. Play, that's, yeah, Lowry. That's exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay. And I was always a bit like, uh, what is the English word, like subconscious? No. Self-conscious. So, so, yeah, self-conscious. Yeah, where you're like uh, not a Not comfortable like talking right, about it. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because like... I felt like I would be judged for like being picky or whatever, but uh -huh. it actually makes me feel like really, really bad. But anyway, like I always had this like thing and I'm just more comfortable, you know, choosing my thing. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And apparently, yeah, it's obviously not you because it's, uh, they popped up like everywhere. I think the first one to do it was like McDonald's and then everyone started copying them. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we're here today with Mache Jacques. Um, I've noticed recently people don't really know how to say your name. <laughs> Mathieu is what I would say. That's correct, right? That's pretty good pronunciation. Yeah, because we have different people like from different parts, uh, mm -hmm. like working all over the world. So I hear yeah. Mate a lot, and I never correct. But do do you care? Like, I was like, no, should I correct no, this no, person? Or not truly? Really. I, I feel like <laughs> I didn't you think know. you would. You strike me as a chill person. Yeah, so. no, I don't. I don't really. I mean, as long as <laughs> you know, it grabs my attention, and I think yeah. I'm I'm being addressed, <laughs> then. Then it works, uh, yeah. And sometimes in Starbucks in like US, I would say John or something, so it's uh -huh. not confusing yeah. for the personal. <laughs> yeah, what is it? it's? Yeah, your name's it would be Matthew, right? Probably in English. Yeah, yeah Mate I Matthew. Guess. Yeah, yeah. Just the Czech version of it. Yeah. Yeah, Mate is our CEO here at Trezor. Uh, we're kicking this off with just a few questions for you about uh, hopefully things that people don't always see or can't find in our other material. Just uh, a more like intimate environment. Uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you is what your life was like prior to being CEO, because mm -hmm. I understand you were you had already come into this position before I started working here. But I know that you did do a few other things up until that point. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your life at Trezor prior to where you are now? Um, yeah, so uh, I started some six years six years ago as a, as a product manager, the first product manager the company had, because it was very much like engineering driven organization and I kind of led my way through different position in the product organization meaning I first led like some small product teams then bigger product teams from you know like uh, being product manager to head of uh, Chesar Suite uh, then becoming the chief product officer and then it eventually led me to uh, my current role and obviously I was way more in detail in, in all our product making in the past, 
but actually mm-hmm. I think we are now very much like product driven organization where we really I mean we've always cared obviously deeply about you know quality of our product and the security of it and etc and the usability uh and but the, I was obviously way more into uh the actual operations of the product team mm-hmm. these days I'm more all over the place <laughs> yeah uh internally but also externally because like now I think we also it's all about um a lot about like marketing and you know going to conferences uh you know talking about our products all as we sit here today right like I do that also for yeah. for other outlets out there so so that changed in in this way quite a lot and obviously I'm also in in more uh the let's say strategic navigation of the company so it's mm-hmm. not just like the product although that's obviously the most important part or the, one of the most important parts uh but uh now i think i need to connect or i'm connecting dots you know between marketing product engineering business right and, and all that did it used to be more i don't know I, I hear about like earlier versions of the company essentially and it it sounds like there were more jobs oriented towards like practicality, like the people building the things or the programmers or firmware or hardware. Uh, whereas now we have like things that are more like getting our name out there, the marketing department, uh, Trezor Expert, like the service that we launched this year, things like that. Is Have you seen that type of change where it was like less things focus, I, I guess maybe more inward or more on the product itself versus uh, the larger picture? Yeah, definitely. I think it's <clears throat> part part of it is the fact that we were a much smaller company when I joined joined Trezor. There were around, I think, thirty or forty people. Uh, that now feels crazy like, to me. <laughs> like twenty yeah, yeah. percent of our current size. <laughs> Ex- exactly. So, so it was a very different uh, team, and obviously, by nat- nature of of that setup, uh, there were a lot of people who would be doing all kind of different things, right? Like not just like one mm-hmm. single professional taking care of, you know, some part of the whole uh, story. Uh, so now I think we are way more professional because we have a dedicated roles for, uh, you know, for basically whatever the customer needs or, or the company needs. Mm-hmm. So so I think that's that's very different. And... And I kind of enjoy both, right? Like because, like I before Trezor, I you know tried to start some of my own startups, and I was in this kind of techie startupy culture in Prague and and even outside of Prague. And then uh, I think again, it was quite common that you would have to do basically everything on your own, right? As a small business owner, you are uh, you are in the morning, you are the like programmer, and in the afternoon, <laughs> you're yeah. the marketing, business, etc., sales. And and I think that's that was very much mm, the case. I think at the, at the beginning of uh, of Trezor. and I think what what are you seeing over the years is that we are basically being every day more and more professional because we are hiring, uh, you know, like skilled people in in the certain domains, mm-hmm. and and that's kind of awesome because like it's it's very sort of humbling and enriching for my let's say career and life as well because it's really cool to work with people that are you know better than i ever was in certain domains right yeah 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 that is uh, interesting to hear i mean yeah you saying like uh you started here about six years ago that was around the time i got into crypto like period it was right Mm -hmm. after like the 2017 Mm -hmm. bull run and i remember like trezor was the first company that i found in the space in in hardware wallet space so that's kind of the one i've always stuck with because of that it was like uh the first name that a friend told me where i worked and so i looked i had lived here before as an english teacher in the czech republic and i remember always looking at our website and being like like seeing like like hardware engineer like seo planning like all these different things and i was like Mm -hmm. i can't do any of it. it was all like science based stuff like very high skilled jobs and I can't do any of that and so when I saw things start expanding more I was like uh like (laughs) maybe I can find my way in here somehow and like luckily that's how things work so I'm glad that that is the direction the company's gone that we've grown and everything Uh, because it's so much fun being a part of this but yeah I see like whenever uh stick and slush for anyone who doesn't know stick and slush were the original the the co-founders of Trezor and now they're almost like I wouldn't say they're figureheads per se because that's a little too detached and we still see them around the office and stuff but i didn't even realize how or i didn't think how directly involved they were with the process in like the early days like i some of our coworkers 
saying like, yeah, Slush was like directly programming things in the early days and some of the crazy situations they went through. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, I don't think about it, but obviously that would have had to have been the case at some point where they were directly hands on and everything. And so I guess with you coming into your position now, that was kind of them being able to take some breathing space or move back because we still see them all the time. But like, did you know them prior to working here? Did you have any relationship with them? No, not at all. I just applied for a job like it, you know, I, I saw this job post and I thought, oh, it looks cool. <laughs> uh-huh. So no, no crypto background prior to actually starting. It was well, I was like, playing with like Bitcoin, but I didn't uh-huh. have any professional experience, let's say, right. in, in the, in the yep. crypto space. And and exactly, it was all them like starting the company, right? Like it, that's what I described that, you know, you would be in the morning, it would be one position and two hours later, something else. That was exactly what uh-huh. they were doing. And it would be programming through nights. Just doing yeah. what had to be done, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And and I think that's when I joined. It was already like a train that would be moving. I think what is the English expression or idiom? Like, yeah, it was already like um, a, like a company, fun- a functional team and company. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just I think uh, as we grew, uh, I think they wanted to be more and more involved with, let's say the strategic directions of the companies, also building other companies, because in Satoshi Labs, it's not just Trezor, there are three other companies, right? right? So I think they, uh, that's 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 what wanted, what they wanted to do with you know, their lives and, and their energy spent um, for Bitcoin. And that's why they, I think, needed professionals that would uh, take care of basically the, the operations, the people management of the company, because the mm-hmm. teams are, again, like we are fairly... Let's say big company, you know, in, yeah. in given the uh, the ecosystem and, and and what we are in Prague. So so yeah, I think they they needed help with that. And yeah, and I was I was I guess I wanted to do that so yeah. <laughs> always. So it's like a dream worked job out. for me. Yeah, worked yeah. out pretty well for you. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, I love it. I've never completely understood. Like I always see things like product manager, and I don't really know what that means. Like mm-hmm. I just <laughs> think manager. I don't th- like in a broad sense. And I feel like until you've gone without something like that, the the closest comparison I have is um, since we're in, in marketing and I'm like making videos, when I first started, mm-hmm. it was like me or videographer, maybe a few other people putting things together. And having to take care of so much can be pretty stressful when you're juggling all these different um, abilities or, or responsibilities. And we hired... Uh, just someone to organize like the scheduling, pretty much the scheduling and the posting of videos. And I never realized how much of a difference I could make. Like <laughs> before that, I would have been like, is that really necessary? Do we need something like this? And then whenever this this girl came in who does it now, like it has been such a relief to not for <laughs> me to not have to worry. It's like a whole other job for sure. Yeah. I was like, how hard this can be? How, how hard can it be? But like, no, genuinely, having this person here has made a massive difference. Yeah. Um, is that similar to what you were doing? I know it's not like the same thing, but like, uh, is that similar to what your role was or what specifically were you doing as the product manager? Yeah, so first, uh, again, it, it goes back to like being more professional team and having a dedicated experts doing certain things. It mm-hmm. really helps a ton. Uh, and and yeah, it's, that's how we grow as a, a, as a company, basically, because it, it, it makes sense, it, of course, to have, you know, expert dedicated to uh, certain projects, certain par- parts of the process, uh, et cetera. Uh, what I've done uh, or what product management is all about is basically connection or intersection of business engineering and design, let's say, or some user experience. Mm-hmm. And the idea is to connect these uh, together for a product that basically users value, right? So mm-hmm. you always look at things from the user's or customer's perspective. So basically what their problem is or you know, what you could what value you, you could de- deliver to them to fix that problem or uh, overcome some challenge in their life. So obviously with Chazer, the challenge is the security of your private keys. Yeah. Uh, right? And so so that's how you look at things through the eyes of the user and you try to be really, uh, let's say, customer or consumer or, or whatever uh, the expression uh, or user-centric in the way that uh, you really try to empathize with uh, with the user. And the role specifically of product managers is um, to make sure uh, basically, you know, engineering <clears throat> and business and, and again, design, et cetera, is aligned in building, you know, great features, great product that that users feel the value. 
And so is that what you mean? I mean, I've, yeah, I've heard people use terms like user driven. You said product driven earlier. Mm -hmm. Is that the same thing, user and product driven? Yeah, essentially, in some way, yes. It, it, it essentially is uh, like a synonym in, in this sense. Uh, the Again, the kind of the point there is that you want, you don't want to just build stuff because it's cool to build something and yep. to uh, really just like use a technology for the sake of, you know, like uh, <laughs> we sometimes use the term like a, uh, uh, like a engineering or technical masturbation in a way that like mm -hmm. it's it's feasible, it's doable, so let's do it. But that's not the point. Yeah. The point is let's do it because certain users in the world really need it for them to be able to succeed, for example, in securing their, their Bitcoin or crypto or, you know, making transactions safer, et cetera, et cetera. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was the thing that made me think of Jurassic Park. I was trying to think of what it was because there's the <laughs> scene where he's like, uh, you spent so long, like, I don't remember the exact quote, you spent so long thinking about what you could do that you didn't stop to think if you should. And uh, that's, yeah, like a perfect example because it is, all of us are very, very close to the product. Um, I've, I only started January of this year, so it's been less than a year for me at the company. And I can already feel how close I am to everything and how easy it is to lose sight of like what do what does our audience like actually want or need? Uh, what does the user actually need? It can be really easy to be like, I want this cool thing to be a part of the next launch or be a part of the product. And it's not actually necessary. You've just yeah. got this like internal bias because you, you've just spent too much time. You're too close to it. Exactly. And I think there's on, on the other side, I think it's a like a good trait of a, a really great product manager that they, they can, again, empathize with the user and be the users of the product themselves because then you can kind of see, mm -hmm. you know, you've got the internal gut kind of navigate navigation there where you kind of know you know what what is probably a good decision or not uh, because not all decisions are you are able to kind of prove by you know hard data or etc sometimes you just have to trust the gut mm -hmm. but by the way the gut is you know probably like millions of interactions you have right. like through through the, your work days uh, so that's how you form the opinion anyway but like yeah empathizing with the user is really important and kind of also because again product management also take care care of um, business in certain way uh, you need to understand that you know all the product managers kind of take care of the thing that it's you're also able to sell it it's not all, just like uh, that we are doing it um, for uh, the sake of being cool or whatever but it's it needs to work for the business as well right like actually being purposeful or useful Exactly. To a larger exactly. audience. Because if it's useful, then people will buy it, right? Yeah. Like that's, yeah. that's the idea. Yeah. When it comes to trusting your gut, like how, from your position, I'm wondering like how you know, like head versus gut with the amount of different people, different voices you have coming in on everything. Mm -hmm. Just for, for anyone watching or listening, obviously this is a podcast, but we have a visual version for anyone who's just listening. <laughs> you want to watch it on YouTube. But uh, we do have a, I guess you would call it a fairly standard structure. You have a, a row of like C-level employees below you mm -hmm. and then several teams below that. And it is, I would say it's still like quite an intimate team or company because you can find or talk to pretty much anyone. I can walk up to anyone at any level and talk to them, which is not something you get at every company. But definitely you see and hear a lot of different at times it feels like valid opinions from several different perspectives. It's like everyone has like things that might not necessarily gel perfectly, but they all feel like very well presented and very well argued. Yep. So it's like, if you're trusting your gut on this thing, how do you know what idea to go with or who to listen to or something with, if, if you ultimately have to make a decision at the top? Yeah, yeah, so I'm a huge believer in what is called idea meritocracy in a way that mm -hmm. basically the best idea wins. Right. Uh -huh. So, so if I'm persuaded by honestly whoever, regardless of their role, regardless of their uh, time spent in the company, regardless of their, uh, their I don't know payroll or whatever you know yeah. it is, if if somebody has a good idea on how to solve certain problem or fix some challenge or simply bring an opportunity that we didn't see up until now, then that idea wins, right? Uh -huh. And then I'm all, all, totally up for it. And I think it's also. Uh, Part of, I, I guess, the idea of meritocracy is also to be kind of able to explain those ideas, right? So that's why I always tell to our team members, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, speak up and don't worry. Like, 
basically bring if if you have an idea, you know, just like talk to who to to me to whoever in the company, yeah, and let's make make it happen, right? Like let's prioritize it. If it's if it's better than everything else we have on the roadmap or on mm-hmm. on, on uh, in the backlog, then then l- let's do it. So I think it's it's very important. Uh, I think also the um, kind of the sort of the believability or or the opinions on how you uh, basically you source some inputs into the decision and then you make some decision around this. So I think it's also important to kind of uh, understand who is making the opinions uh, mm-hmm. and why. And if they are believable in the way that they have the experience, they pr- provide the real, yeah. you know, the good data, et cetera. So, so kind of the believability of some 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 decisions or some inputs into the decisions is also quite quite important, right? So right. So just having yeah, I guess enough of a, a reason to pursue something ultimately. Exactly. I mean, that's yeah, I guess that is what uh, merit means <laughs> at its yeah, core. Yeah. Exactly that. Yeah, exactly. So and again, if it, it comes to the expertise and some professionalism, so if if you have experts, you know, like for example, we have the utmost you know experts in cryptography, obviously because we are like a crypto security company, uh, then uh, you know, I t- totally trust them that more than an- anybody else on on certain security decisions, right? Yeah. Like I, I would, I cannot make the decision without like their expert opinion, for mm-hmm. example. Sure. Yeah, that's one thing that uh, I noticed immediately at this company. Like some of these things that you're saying, it it sounds like just like BS that a lot of people say sometimes at company, mm-hmm. like different companies. But I know because I've been here that it's not because I've seen these things actually exercised at the I company. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've watched people like we we use these words all the time, like like honesty, transparency, integrity. And every I mean, yeah, I'm not going to name names, but pretty much every company I've worked at, it always looks shinier on the outside than it does on the inside. Like you get into the company and you realize things are a little more messy, a little more dirty, um, maybe even corrupt in certain cases, um, which is like a pretty heavy word. But I've seen that at places that I've been. Uh, I've been, I guess, at this point working for maybe almost like 20 years at different companies. And this is like the first time I ever came somewhere and I was like, all of this is exactly as advertised. <laughs> like seeing the way that people talk about things, like internally to each other, mm-hmm. being able to communicate openly, like maturity, all of these things, but especially transparency. Um, I've, I've, I didn't realize until I came here how cynical I'd become about companies. <laughs> like I'd just be like, I don't believe that they're they're hiding something. There's something like underneath we don't know about. Uh, Trezor is like v- easily the most open and honest and transparent company I've ever worked for. And that's like, you feel it like when you're working here. It's one of the things that I think makes it like so fun. This is not just me saying this because I have the CEO on the podcast. That's, <laughs> that's, these are my no, actual but, opinions. <laughs> and I, obviously I'm super glad glad about this, right? And, and, and like to take it one step further, I'm not going to say this because I'm the CEO and I'm reporting to the founders, but I really think it also comes down like the... Uh, to the farmers as well, who are yeah. I think extremely. I would agree with that. Yeah, like uh, authentic people who mm-hmm. really value transparency, and and I think they would they would you know fire me or anybody else on the management or in the, or in the company, and the first day they would realize that we are not honest or mm-hmm. you know, not being transparent about something. So, so I think that's that's how they build the culture when they started the company. What like eleven years ago or something. Yeah. So, and 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 yeah, and naturally I think it it. Um, it brings people in who have, I guess, similar values. Yeah, we protect those values. So if if there's obviously we are getting bit bigger, but like if we didn't, I guess if we saw some behavior that that doesn't you know resonate with the values, we would probably uh-huh. say goodbye to those to those people, right? Like, but like I'm I, I'm obviously I'm super glad you say it, but like mm-hmm. I I I think we need to also protect it as we grow and and, and yeah, you know, it's hard to do as you expand. I mean, because you have so much, you can give less and less attention to yeah, yeah, more sure. and more people. It does make it sure. difficult. Yeah, I, obviously, I hope that is retained as well as we grow. Because I'm, obviously, I'm sure we will. That seems to be the direction things are going. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't have the solution to that. I guess that's your problem. That's not my problem. <laughs> I don't have to deal <laughs> yeah, with that. And, you and have to deal way, with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, I, well, it's in, in some way, it's I think everyone's responsibility because yeah. like the culture of the company. It's not me. It's it's mm-hmm. everybody, right? Yep. Like it's 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 everybody who participates in what we do, the way we uh, basically go about business every single day, right? Mm-hmm. So, so that's that. The only one small addition I can do is like I still have uh, basically like the final interviews with everybody that we interview for for yep. Chaser. 
it's you know it's not only because of kind of protecting the values that's that's one part but i also want to get simply <laughs> get to know the people and kind of understand the reasoning and and their kind of why's uh the why they you know w- w- why they would like to work with us and what are their hobbies as well but i think for me it's like kind of a good um how to say uh check into their yeah but like value and belief systems in in mm-hmm. you know like in in that way, I can at least little uh, like control a little bit if like, yeah, yeah. You know, if they are the right people. You at least touch base with each. Yes, Do you literally? Yes. Yeah, I think probably no one knows that. But in our hiring structure, I guess if if I'm not allowed to talk about this, we'll just edit this out afterwards. <laughs> but like uh, the very last thing that happens when you're getting hired at Trezor is you have a conversation. It's usually you and one other person, right? It's just me. the 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 final uh-huh. vibe check is is basically just me. Okay. Because yeah. I thought it was also like a better how to say like a more intimate um, space where yeah. you know, they can ask anything, I can ask anything, and and we basically touch base on uh-huh. you know, like on on what their values are, what but also what they like to do in their personal lives as well. I, I like to ask those questions around you know hobbies <laughs> etc. Uh, and yeah, and I think it's quite you know it's 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 been quite nice. And by the way. Uh, there were cases where I basically said, mm, "Sorry, no, like this, this doesn't work for us." All the so, way at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's nerve wracking. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to those people, but like, uh, yeah, I just didn't, I didn't believe that they would be happy here. Um, yeah, and we literally call it a vibe check. That's yeah, like yeah, the end. Yeah, yeah, it's it's funny because the first time you hear that, it sounds like, like I remember I was talking to someone else and. It's like the first time you hear it, it's almost like, what is this like Gen Z term that we're just using like <laughs> at the end of all this? But like you actually feel it in the company, like the um, the congruent nature of how everybody gets along very well. Like it's very, at least in my experience, everything is very smooth. People, people run. Uh, it's like, a well, cliche terms. People say like well-oiled machine. That's like a overused term for it, but it really does feel that way. Like, uh, the personalities just mesh and jive really well together. And I do think that contributes to an extent because it's like, it's not just something that I was like, you know, this is, I don't know, silly or why do we have to do this type of thing? Like it actually does make a difference. I think so. so. I believe so. Yeah. yeah. I felt that way after going through it. And cool. awesome. yeah, you probably made the right choice. I mean, you're a really relaxed guy, so I can't imagine if you didn't like someone that it wouldn't be a good <laughs> decision. But yeah, I remember ours was, was pretty chill. And we had one other guy, I think in mine, um, mm-hmm. which made it relax, which was fun. But um, just in terms of, yeah, more questions about you. There were some specific ones I wanted to ask you, like what is a typical day like for you? Cause I know that when I was trying to schedule this in the first place, so just our podcast meeting, I did say before Mate is like here in the building with us. You can walk up to anyone. I can walk up to him. But after I saw your schedule, it's like, I never want to do that again. I never want to take your time knowing how much you actually have going on. It was just like a, it was Monday through Friday and just a solid block from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every single day. Um, So do you have like any type of consistency day to day or is it just like every week, every day is totally different? What is it like for you? I'm actually quite methodical, I would say, around uh, scheduling meetings and kind of the occurrence of, of certain interactions I have with certain people in the company. Uh, and obviously, I'm trying to be quite protective of my time because... Uh-huh. Uh, I would be as well. Like, <laughs> now that I know what I know, that's definitely how I would be too. I mean, it's a, it's it can be like a huge energy drainage as well, like when, when um, uh, you know, you have certain maybe meetings that are not effective, et cetera. So I always want to see, you know, like a good agenda and all that stuff, all the prep, like for what makes a good meeting. But like uh, meeting, honestly, meeting people as a, as a gist of the answer is like, is a big mm-hmm. part of, of the job because I need to understand what's happening in the company. I need mm-hmm. to understand what's happening outside of the company. I need to kind of download the brains of people that are way smarter than me and uh-huh. are more knowledgeable <laughs> about certain things, yeah. right? So again, that's th- those inputs for certain decisions or some s- strategic, let's say, navigation of the company, mm-hmm. and um, and it's also uh, stakeholder management in a way that uh, I talk to our founders. Uh, you know, pretty much, uh, mm-hmm. I would say on a weekly be- basis, we we touch base on certain topics. Uh, we discuss, you know, some uh, again like urgent issues or our you know whatever it needs to be discussed. Maybe some innovation path that we ha- that we are on. And certain decisions there, et cetera, because again, obviously they're very knowledgeable about that. He started the whole industry, yeah, hardware wallet. So, um, 
So that's yeah, that's that. And yeah, and then as a result, in the, in the calendar, it looks like mess. But actually, I mean, I I, I enjoy it very much. <laughs> ah, so it fits. That passes your vibe check. Is <laughs> this lifestyle <laughs> that you have? I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and and again, I think it's it, it comes down to like me, you know, working with people that are excited about their jobs, and and that makes yeah. me like m motivated, and you know, gives me a ton of energy. I will say the time here has like melted, like <laughs> unlike any other company that I've been at, because this is like such like such a fun subject to dig into and, and being able to contribute to something that's in so much development, like we're, uh, I guess they call it the adoption period that we're in now, which is spreading Bitcoin and normalizing it mm -hmm. in, in wider circles. Since I, I don't even know what the first phase would have been called, or I think there's like multiple that people have kind of, it's not like official or not completely formalized, but in the community, it's like there was the kind of the foundational years, pretty much all the years where people knew about Bitcoin, but everyone thought it was a joke. Um, it still is that way to an extent. There's a lot of people like I told my, I told my grandmother that I was working at like a cryptocurrency company in Europe. And she gives me like one of these faces, like, <laughs> like she's like, what are you talking about? Sort of thing. Uh, but it is still like it's it's more authentic and more legitimate to many more people than it was five or ten or fifteen years ago. Like yeah. certainly, and that's a very exciting time to be in. Like coming into work every day and knowing like the things we're doing are actually contributing to development and growth. And it's not just like like a lot of companies are established and their whole thing is just like maximize as much as you possibly can. That's the only name of the game. Mm -hmm. And here it feels like we're actually building towards meaning and something that is having an impact on the world, uh, which is a hard message to get across, especially with, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the, 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 like we love them too, but the cryptocurrency industry has a lot of like, you know, memes and like crypto bros and just things that uh, sometimes might hurt the, I don't know, the legitimacy, the, the feel of cryptocurrency, it kind of, to me, this is just my personal opinion, but it can make it harder to give it some of that authenticity that we are often going for as a company. Just like, I think it's, 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 I think those are good sort of remarks. And I think what we are, again, coming back to the core of our product, we are in the self-custody business, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where it's like utmost, mm, let's say, it's, it's very important uh, for uh, our users to trust our product and, and the kind of reasoning why we do it uh, because the product itself is around giving you the power of yeah. managing your assets directly, right? It's not, not about trusting other companies. You don't have to trust, um, you know, any third-party intermediary. You basically, once you get the hardware wallet, you basically are your own boss in terms of, you know, how you manage whatever you put on it. So... Mm. So yeah, I think it's 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 quite important that we mm, that we are perceived like that, and that mm. um, yeah, those are the values that we try to kind of convey to the world. Yeah, I think once you grasp that, once that clicks, things start to make much more sense because it is becoming a more um, like recognized part of the financial world. Like for mm -hmm. so long, it was just seen as like the the classic meme is like magic internet money. That's literally what it was on Reddit. It's like a Microsoft Paint image, like of the wizard. If you're in the community, you know this already. But anyone who isn't, like, might not know the history. But like, that it, it's come a long way <laughs> since then, and it's really cool to, like, I, I just had the realization at some point, like, what we do didn't exist at a certain point. Like, Bitcoin was invented, you know, years ago, 15 years ago. But the problems, the stories that we know of, like, slush, for example and the the bitcoin being compromised online and a lot of it being lost in the early days like that wouldn't have happened with the technology we have today it's because uh, and i believe that was the exact situation that kind of sparked the idea is that he wanted to find a way to protect the asset um yeah and, and make it also easier to, to manage it because that was mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh i mean i said i was the first product manager of the company but that's not really true because those were actually the founders who were, uh, yeah. were the guys you like thinking that. about like, how can you, how can we make you know sure that like private keys are secure but also something that you could like actually use yeah. and not through some like super complicated like you know, something setup. more human friendly like, exactly yeah. some, some, something that would be like uh, uh, human friendly in a way that like you can use it every day mm -hmm. and you would not be like scared Whatever so first you would not ha need to have like an engineering degree to to do right. it like well, yeah. and secondly something that you would actually like you know enjoy and and you would not 
uh, be kind of scared in every single step of, of the way of like sending a transaction, for example. Mm -hmm. so. so really just accessibility. I think that could probably yeah, yeah. sum it up in like mm -hmm. one word. Yeah. And that is how it feels like when you, when you realize like the, like the backup, for example, having a 12 or 24 word or now 20, the newest standard, a 20 word backup, knowing that that correlates to long strings of code underneath and that like originally people were typing in numbers and letters, huge strings of numbers and letters in order to keep track of everything. But that's what, yeah, that's what we mean by something that's more human accessible uh, yeah, yeah, is yeah. something that is much easier to remember or write down somewhere and keep. Exactly. Which because again, like, didn't exist <laughs> before. Yeah, yeah. Because like the, the, the BIP39, the protocol or the standard that we, that we invented uh, was basically doing exactly that, like trans translating those uh, private keys or something that's like very hard. I, like you can imagine like a super long Wi-Fi password. Yeah. Uh, and you know, translating it, it into something that is like human, human, like readable, meaning mm -hmm. words, uh, of, you know, English words. So, so that's uh, obviously like a huge, mm, you know, usability benefit. Mm -hmm. So with the amount of time that you're spending, I just wanted to touch on that one more time with the amount of time that it takes, that this job takes up during your week, mm -hmm. every week, how exactly do you spend your time outside the company? If it's like at that, at the point that you're at, it's like, um, like I know, we're not trying to put you on like a pedestal, like Maki is like better than anyone else or anything like that. But there is like weight to your decisions. And for a lot of people, it's very easy for you to uh, project like into the future. That's what stresses people out. You think about <laughs> the rippling effect that your decisions might have. Um, and I know, yeah, even, yeah, I struggle with that even at my level as well. But uh, for me, it's like, I don't know, stoicism. That's like my answer. Just thinking about the here and now and not getting too freaked out about things in the future. But it's like, how do you disconnect if if you've got all these things going on and how do you reconcile the weight that uh, your decisions carry? Yeah, so I would first probably talk about the decisions uh, themselves in a way that we, it's not just me, honestly. It's the, well, it's a whole company and, and, and it's the management I have around myself and, and, and the founders as well. So, so, you know, it would be hard for me to make some really huge uh shitty part of mm -hmm. my French decision <laughs> yeah. that would like go unnoticed and it would not get checked by somebody in the on the team, right? Uh -huh. So so I think we have pretty like flat structure in this way. So I'm not like right. uh like some autocrat that would like say it's going to be <laughs> like this way. Yeah. I think it's the like it's it's more about like keeping making sure that every that actually the set of like hundreds of decisions in in the year maybe are in the good and consistent direction, mm -hmm. you know, resonates with the culture of the company or forms the culture company well, uh, resonates or, or is aligned with the mission and vision of the company. You know, those things are, I think, really, really important. I think that's where the kind of uh, devil in the detail lies. In, in mm -hmm. a way, it's like that. that is really important because that could go unnoticed. But there are no like a huge, I would say, um, like extremely huge decision that would be just me, right? It's always uh -huh. always the team, and 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 as I said before, it is quite important. Uh, uh, I mean that I I mean I basically work with people again, like that are smart, smarter than me, mm -hmm. more knowledgeable about around certain things, and and I always also say we always try to hire for people that are better than than we are currently in the company. So we go in the spiral sort of up in in terms yeah. of like being more knowledgeable, being more professional, etc. Because the other uh, scenario would be basically a downward spiral. It would mm -hmm. mean we are getting worse over time, right? So, yeah. so we definitely don't want to do that. Um, so, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that and how I relax. Because yeah, it, it is a fairly demanding job. Is, uh, I mean, I run quite a lot. I, I love to do a lot of sports. I spend uh -huh. a good uh, and deal of time in, um, uh, in in the mountains. I love to climb bar gliding uh yeah and all that stuff i know that there's been times where there was like maybe some event coming up and i was like oh like where's Matthew? is he around they're like no he's rock climbing right now he's <laughs> just somewhere on a mountain <laughs> we're like oh okay he'll be back on friday it's like okay <laughs> cool yeah, um, and, and it's cool i mean uh like uh two weeks ago we uh, with my friend we climbed like a uh, south face of marmolada which is like one of the um, um, bigger peaks in the dolomites and uh, it was actually a two-day like a rock climbing trip because we actually had to sleep at the wall as well. Like and on 
yeah, the wall the, you were climbing? Yeah, yeah. There's like a small cave that you just like uh, get into and you sleep there and then the next day you continue. What if you the, get there and the there's someone else there already? <laughs> Do you all just shack up together? I mean, there, there are set up spaces for like uh, most uh -huh. spaces, let's say. Well, n not in this like very little cave, but like there are, <laughs> uh, let's say, other, other opportunities where you can sleep. Like you have to climb to the next cave and go there. <laughs> I mean, literally, yeah. That's There was like a Polish uh, uh, pair of climbers and they had to, you know, uh, crawl up into some, some other cave. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so this is like a, a 1100 meters of, you know, uh, of like code climbing. Yeah. And then there really you just focus on the thing like and and that's and I, I guess I mean, people call it like extreme sports that I don't think it's extreme because there's like some certain precautions and et cetera. And then some like experience that comes into it before you can actually do it. But I just wanted to say you really focus on, on that. And I forget completely about the work for like two days mm -hmm. and that perfectly sort of like cleans my how to say like, like clears your head or, clears, oh cle yeah. you say cleanses your aura yeah That's it's, like, yeah, it's yeah. like i i i come the next day to the uh, to the office and i'm like uh -huh. i'm so ready it's to totally be refreshed stuff. Yeah, totally, totally refreshed clean. because uh -huh. like i haven't thought about it for like two days right yeah uh, for really like 48 hours i i couldn't you know i didn't think about it because i really had to focus on uh um you know that activity so i just need to like climb a mountain and sleep in a cave <laughs> and that'll that'll do it for me. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, think I've that climbed was the point exactly. <laughs> Eleven hundred meters. I don't think I've done that in my life. I mean, like cumulatively, if you add in all climbing I've done, I don't think it would be eleven hundred meters. I guess like toddlers probably climbed a lot as well. I don't know. I mostly um, went forward. I didn't go up. So <laughs> that, that's what I did when I was a, a toddler. I think. Um, so so far this year, we're almost at the end of the year. I think this episode we've we're planning on it coming out in October. Uh, so if you're listening or watching in October, then we were successful in that. But um, <laughs> we're nearing the end of the year. What would you say is uh, the most, actually, other than the release of the Trezor Save 5, that was like our big thing this mm -hmm. year, was the big Trezor Save 5 release in the summer. Other than that, what would you say is the most exciting thing uh, that has happened or is yet to come? We still have like one quarter left. We've got like three months. <laughs> so you can answer before or after. What would you say is the most exciting thing outside of the TS5? Yeah, so product wise, unfortunately, is the TS TS five for sure. Mm -hmm. But I was pretty excited about um, the whole Bitcoin Prague. I think was was uh, or BTC Prague. Sorry, I'm I'm butchering the name. Are we not allowed to say Bitcoin Prague? Yes, no, I, I got ye yelled at for it. Oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I didn't know that. I think we are sh sh uh, shooting some uh, commercial or some like inv not uh -huh. like an invitation. Like, and don't I, say Bitcoin. I, I kept saying Bitcoin Prague. <laughs> I was like, no, the official brand name is BTC Prague. Uh huh. So yeah, so I very much enjoy BTC Prague. I think it's it's a, it's really an awesome event, and it's a bit amazing that how many people come to like an event that you know would be yeah. it's based in Prague, right? Like it's it's we are not like a huge city or or anything. So yeah, I met another American guy. He just he walked up. He's like, "Hey, how's it going?" Like I'm from California, and I was like, "Man, you really <laughs> took a long leg to get out here." There yeah. were people from all over the place. And that play, if you can make it, if you're listening or watching BTC Prague, not Bitcoin Prague, <laughs> is uh, a fantastic event. That was my first one this year. And it was just like, it's a wild couple of days because it just doesn't stop. You're just going the whole time. And the presentation is excellent. It's like these two massive warehouses. They're all set up super well. I'm looking forward to it next year. I just want to go to all events now because that was so much fun. I yeah, love doing that. Yeah, me too. Honestly, I, I'm not <clears throat> um, very sort of... Not to say outspoken is the word or like i'm not like that like social or yeah, that, like outgoing yeah like outgoing yeah. in a way that i would be i'm not like a sales type of person that yeah. i would just like go to every door and yeah <laughs> bother people uh and and so like these bigger conferences i would typically not enjoy i guess in the past but like i don't know like the vibe there is is really nice yeah. and, and i and i really really enjoyed it it's very uh, comfortable yeah and i'm not answering the question so uh, what we can, I think, look forward to is definitely, uh, well, I'm hoping for Bitcoin uh, price to pick up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's that's the one I'm, I'm, I'm that's the Q4 uh, that we are uh, reserving this for. Uh -huh. um, but let's see. But like, I think the predictions are, are there, but the, those might be, of course, all, uh, totally wrong. But like um, that I would like to see. Uh, we are also working on a new product for the next year. So that's honestly something I know you're asking mm -hmm. for this year, but like. That's honestly it keeps okay. me very, very excited. I, it's easy it's, to get excited about things. Exactly. I get it. <laughs> it's hard to uh, kind of push it out of the, uh, of the th thought process. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and we are hoping to add, you know, the the, the secure element there as well that we are mm -hmm. 
working on with our partner company Tropic Square. So yeah, those 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 would be the that comes first to mind. That is a good thing to bring up because I think a lot of people yeah you know, don't know anything about Tropic Square since it's so new. Um, mm-hmm. what, is it our newest company that we have underneath Satoshi Labs? I mm, I'm not sure if Vex Vexel. Oh yeah, Vexel as well. Pra- Vexel is probably no Vexel is the is the newest. Yeah yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, and I was you just might thinking be where it's on the timeline when it started, but like I think Vexel is the newest. Uh huh. If you're a listener, viewer, and I mean, most likely, yeah, this is the Trezor podcast, so um, Trezor Talks, I guess that's our name for it. And if, if you're watching, like you, you might be like me, where I'm like, oh, like before I worked here, I probably would have been like, oh, other companies, I don't care. It would have just been very dismissive. Mm-hmm. Now that I know what they are, it's like really exciting. Um, Tropic Square being. Well, I think, I mean, fact check me on this if you're listening or watching. Um, the first open source microchip is what we're going for here. I believe that doesn't exist anywhere else. As far as I know, it doesn't. And we want to be, or Tropic Square wants to be the first to be fully open source. Open source meaning we don't really hide any of the way that it's made or any of the documentation behind the actual physical chip itself, which is what we do with software already. I think that's, again, if people are watching, they probably know that on the software side. We have open source code for Trezor. You can go look it up on GitHub and read everything yourself. We don't hide anything. But now we're doing that for a physical microchip, which we eventually want to use in our own products. I don't know how that's going to play out um, because I'm not educated enough on it, I guess. But uh, it provides a way. Actually, I I remember you mentioning it the other day, the disadvantage of not being able to talk about things. Like if if things are not open source, I don't know if you want to touch on that at all. Yeah, sure. So maybe just very briefly, um, the secure elements are basically a specialized chip that, you know, help to protect the secrets, the the, the private keys from Mm -hmm. being stolen or extracted. Uh, physically from from the device, right? Like if someone breaks into a device, exactly, and tries if, to get if it. somebody got hold of, of your device and they had very specialized equipment, uh, these chips make it really like hard for them, or let's say close to impossible to you know to extract the, those like mm-hmm. secrets, those private keys, which is again like super uh, super important because uh, you're talking about self custody. We are talking about users, you know, protecting their own private keys through the means of hardware wallets. So that's why it's important. And there was no solution on the market where that would be uh, that would be open source. So that's it's not auditable. So you don't really know whether there are some backdoors or some some you know yeah. issues that the company is not disclosing to their customers, which is when you think about it, not a great behavior, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, so yeah. So that's the whole idea behind behind uh, Tropic Square. And and in theory, the problem there is basically then even uh, of these through the, all the non-disclosure agreements, the NDAs uh, in the market, even if you found, so let's say we sign an NDA with some company and we find a vulnerability in, in the mm-hmm. given chip by, you know, basically testing it ourselves, then we would not even be able to talk about it publicly, yeah. uh, right, with, with anybody. And uh, yeah, and I can admit those cases happened in the past, and and uh, it's it's a problem. Yeah, that's just crazy to me because it's like something I'd never even considered before I came here. Mm-hmm. When it's like, oh, why are we doing this? And it's like, well, there's this problem in the industry yeah. where companies can't talk about things because of NDAs, and that is basic directly anti-consumer. Like it is not exactly. good for people uh, exactly. who own these products. And the the more alarming implication there is knowing that there are definitely, like not just in the crypto industry, but in all industries, all electronic industries, there are companies under things like that that Mm -hmm. are almost, we don't know, I guess, you can't prove it, but almost certainly they know things where there are flaws or vulnerabilities in the things that you're using. That can be your computer, that can be an iPhone, that can be any number of technologies that people use where like this thing could have some sort of flaw that could compromise your data, your privacy, your finances, any number of these things. Mm-hmm. And companies just don't talk or can't. They can't legally uh, exactly. because they've signed these things. Exactly. So then knowing like that we have an entire company dedicated to fixing this problem, I think is super cool. And once you understand that, that makes it far more interesting versus just like microchip company. Because like that's kind of that's all I knew before. It's like, <laughs> oh, they're making a microchip, of course, because they have a hardware product. But then understanding the purpose of why they're doing that, that just makes it so more gripping, so much more engaging to me. Yeah. And it's similar with Vexel. Like, yeah, like you said, they're that's our. I think you're right. That is our, our newest company. 
um, because their whole thing is actually uh, using Bitcoin for its original purpose, peer to peer. Um, I typically, since that's more of an industry term you hear all the time, I like to say person to person because that just makes in my brain that makes more sense. Like it's more, more human readable. I yeah, guess. yeah. Again, we're back to that versus these more technical terms. Like, I, I, I mean, I'm used to peer to peer now because we say it so much. But if you're someone newer to the cryptocurrency space, like it might still sound weird. Mm -hmm. So literally, it there's no difference. It just means trading with another person or trading someone to someone else. Yeah. And it's kind of, I think the maybe the most succinct way we can describe it. It is a a hub that you can get. It's like an app you can put on your phone, yes. and you can see other people that are either wanting to buy or sell cryptocurrency. So this way you don't have to go through an exchange, which a lot of times will list your personal information or require your personal information. This is all anonymous and you can meet up with someone and make the trade in person as originally intended. Exactly. So it's not a requirement. You don't have to use it, but it is a really cool thing that you can do as an option. Uh, and I used it at BTC Prague. That was the first time I used it nice. was during the <laughs> event. And it was so cool. I just wa I walked up to a guy. I said, hey, I have, if we can see this on, on camera, I said, I have flower shoes on. Come find me. <laughs> and some some kid walks up. I say kid. He was probably like 19, 20, something like that. And he goes, hey, here you go. I handed him cash. He sent me Bitcoin. And I was like, and we walked away. That was it. I was <laughs> nice. like, that is so cool. <laughs> it was like so smooth and so simple. Nice, and once you do it, that's kind of um, one of our Grafton, a, a guy who works uh, with Vexel, one of the representatives there. He was the guy who said, like, once you get it, suddenly it clicks and like you're on board. It was like so easy to do and so easy mm -hmm. to get into. Um yeah, that's Vexel and Tropic Square. For that's our little that that was not intended to be an advertisement for both of those companies, but it, it basically just became one while we were talking about it. Uh, let's get back to crypto. Let's get back to Trezor. I should say it all. It's all cryptocurrency. But uh, what do you think is the road to? We talked about adoption earlier and how we're in this phase of uh, providing more uh, legitimacy and authenticity to the cryptocurrency space. Uh, what would you say is the the road to, I mean, it's an arbitrary number, but just the road to like 100 million users in self-custody or just, yeah, normalizing self-custody, putting things in your own wallet instead of leaving it on an exchange or in someone else's control? How do we get to that point? Yeah. So, so I think we definitely uh, still have to make it more, more accessible, more user-friendly. Uh, and it's exactly, as I said many times in this discussion, that's what we are thinking about all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And how we can make it more, more, yeah, user friendly. That's how the company started, and that's how it continues. That's that's what is basically in the, written in the in the mission of the, of the company as well. So, so I think that's that's one way, uh, or let's say one pillar. The other one is definitely uh, broader Bitcoin adoption as well, because we can discuss of how much is the percentage of self custody is going to be in the future because actually it's not a huge number for for now like how many actually uh hardware world users uh there are compared to all the crypto uh users in the world mm -hmm. uh but again i think we can do it we can we can make that number uh larger and that split or or that rate of um, by basically making you know the products uh more user friendly and more more, more accessible but also most likely uh, there are some predictions that you know the 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 amount of of users using Bitcoin and other, other cryptocurrencies is probably going to double or triple over the next bull market. So so that will definitely uh, uh -huh. you know, be part of the story as well. I mean that is what's been happening each bull market, right? There's like a whole yeah. new it's like a new generation almost exactly. a new wave of new people. Exactly. That's why yeah I, when I tell people once you're in the industry you can speak about it more openly and people know what you're talking about. But mine mm -hmm. was the 2017 bull yeah. run. Uh -huh. Like when I said earlier I got into it in 2018. I think of that as my first year because the 2017 run was like in winter of that year. It was like the very end of the year. And so everyone was talking about it going into like January and February of that year. Mm -hmm. And that's like a very clear marker. And then you hear about people in the 2021 bull run. That was like the next one that happened. Yeah. And we're, I'm at the point, honestly, my, my own opinion is like, it's stopped being an if and more of a win to me. It's like, no one can call when the next one's going to happen. Yeah, but I'm like, it's gonna happen. Like that's that's kind of how I feel. Which obviously nothing is a hundred percent. Like that's one of the the basic tenets or rules, foundational ideas with yeah, yeah. anything, <laughs> not just yeah. crypto, just anything. <laughs> like you can't say for sure that there is going to be another bull run technically, but based on what we know, it seems and based on more like once you start becoming more 
more educated and more fluid with how all these things work, you start having an understanding of the larger picture. It's kind of like, how can it not? It, it stops. Uh, there's like a lot of the basic questions or the, the most common questions where people are like, you know, what does cryptocurrency even do? Like, you can't see it, you can't touch it. How does it actually have value? And when you start, uh, we talked about how it relates to the financial industry earlier. Mm -hmm. When you start seeing how it fits in and how it follows a lot of the rules just in a more modern way, uh, it really starts to make more sense. And it's not just, I mean, yeah, sure, price, specific price is speculation. But the security and the the firmness of this as an industry moving forward uh, it becomes quite convincing, I would say, as you move forward, as you learn about the history of money and the way that it's treated and yeah. things like that. Um, the last question I had for you is sort of related to this. It's a, it's along the same vein, but what would you recommend for people trying to break into the crypto industry? Um, if someone's like not super familiar with it, they don't know where to start, Like, how would you recommend people go about getting more familiar with everything? Yeah, so I'd say uh, start small. Uh, learn a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many resources these days, you know, like how on um, how to get more knowledgeable about Bitcoin. Yeah. I would, by the way, say start with Bitcoin for sure, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, that's how this whole thing started. And uh, that's honest. Also, what I personally believe is is the main reason why I'm into it. And, and, um, and because it really brings better money into this world. Then it leads you to, okay, what is actually money? Uh, then you kind of start to understand maybe some, uh, a bit more about like economics and sociology ar around why uh, why and how money is important for us and why we need better money, to be honest. And then, mm -hmm. uh, but then I should get very practical. Then you can really buy Bitcoin through either Vexel, but also a lot of you know exchanges uh, on the uh, online, which is honestly I think it's fine if you start there, yeah. very like with small amounts, uh, whatever that is for you, and then once you you know probably have uh, more Bitcoin or more crypto, just move to hardware wallet because yeah, uh, ideally to us obviously, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, get a treasure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is not an advertisement, but like hardware wallets are basically you know devices that are that helps you, help you to pr protect those. Uh, those mm -hmm. assets so so that's that's uh, and and you can buy by the way uh, crypto uh, through um, the apps that we provide for free as well so so yeah I, I would I would recommend probably those uh, those those steps but I, I think it starts with with education as, yeah, as most things definitely in the world. <laughs> yeah the, I think the number one thing you see is just assumptions being made yeah. but the technology in the space there's lots of social narratives with everything that's just kind of naturally a way that things happen. Uh, but every person I know that has looked more into it has ended up becoming more convinced, not less. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I have, I have the same same uh, experience. And by the way, on education, I think you are doing a great job on like helping people on our cool. social media. I hope so. <laughs> like I said, I like working here, so <laughs> I'll, I'll continue doing it. No, I as really love a, lo a lot of these like analogies that are that you are using, guys, and it's it's awesome. It's it's it's, it's nice. Yeah, it's a good time. Uh, well, yeah, I think that that's that probably about ra wraps us up, I think, for the day. I'm starting a tradition where we awkwardly shake hands off of Mike since we <laughs> sure. have to come around like that. There we go. Thanks for coming on for today. Thanks for the time. Thanks for having me, Like Sean. I said, I know you have a crazy schedule. So uh, enjoy the rest of your week since I'm sure there's no gaps anywhere <laughs> until you're done. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm not quite as uh, – I'll, I'll be able to relax after this as we pack everything up here. <laughs> but good luck with what you're doing. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next episode. Thank <laughs> you.